I, I'm really glad to be here, so thank you. And I, I thank the League of Women Voters uh, in Concord, Carlisle, the Acton area, um, and, and really across the country um, where this kind of conversation and study about the impacts of Citizens United, about free speech, money, and democracy is going on in the way um, only the League can do, which is deep, serious, um, and consensus building. And uh, it's a very effective model. I'm proud to be a member of the League of Women Voters here in Concord, in Carlisle. Um, but I speak with my own views tonight, um, and not for the League, as that study obviously is ongoing. And these are my own, my own views, and um, fortunately shared, I think, by many Americans. And tonight, I'll, I'll try to outline why I think that is. Um, so next week is the sixth anniversary of Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. Uh, January 20th, 2010, uh, the Supreme Court struck down what was known as the McCain-Feingold Law, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, and particularly the provisions that limited corporate and union spending in elections in certain windows, right before an election, 30 days before a primary, 60 days before a general election. Um, the Supreme Court struck that down in Citizens United. Uh, the impacts, as I'll talk about in a, a little bit, um, have been uh, both grave and, and extraordinary and rapid in the country. And um, the kind of uh, conversation we're having tonight about the impacts and about what we can do about it and about the 28th Amendment to the Constitution uh, are going on all over the country as a result. And I think the reason is, is that what the Supreme Court did in that case is very similar, um, although in different contexts, to what it has a um, unfortunate proclivity to do uh, historically. If we, as I um, will uh, propose tonight, offer tonight for your consideration, um, predict, uh, pass and, and ratify the 28th Amendment, which will overturn Citizens United, it will be the eighth time that Americans had to come together to correct a, a catastrophic Supreme Court decision. So we've been here before. Um, other times the Supreme Court ruled women have no right to vote. The Supreme Court ruled that African Americans cannot be citizens of the United States of America. The Supreme Court ruled that poll taxes that kept Americans who didn't have economic means from voting were perfectly fine. The Supreme Court ruled that an income tax would violate the constitutional rights of the wealthy. The Supreme Court ruled that young people can be conscripted into the armed forces, forced into a war overseas, and have no right to vote. Every one of those things was overturned by a constitutional amendment. And I think we will now um, see that it's our turn to respond as, our, uh, as people did before us in America. Um, so let me first, though, start with, with uh, what I think happened in Citizens United. They don't, I, the Supreme Court has smart people, and they're honorable people. Uh, so, so how did it happen? I think what happened is, for five members of the court, uh, they, they brought together trends that had been happening over the past few decades, and two in particular. One, one the first trend, is that of the sort of metaphor of money as speech, the idea that spending money in campaigns, spending money in elections is like free speech, therefore any effort on our part, federal, state, or local, to limit that is what Justice Kennedy called censorship. Uh, so that limiting money is limiting speech is therefore censorship. That's one trend, it goes back as many of you know to the Buckley versus Vallejo case, and, 1976 that struck down some of the post-Watergate uh, reforms. This is the second trend, though, is, the, is the, uh, an equally misplaced metaphor, in my view, the idea that corporations are, are people, uh, that corporations are like people, they have the rights of people, and therefore, if money is speech and corporations are people, corporations spending money to influence the outcome of an, of an election also is uh, protected by the First Amendment, and any effort to limit that, likewise, is, is what Justice Kennedy in Citizens United called censorship. So, in Citizens United, these two propositions came together. We therefore have unlimited spending by corporations, unions, and anyone um, who wins Powerball tonight uh, <laughs> will be able to do it too. So, 
I have three propositions for you to consider. Uh, the first one is uh, that um, Citizens United uh, is not a inevitable or even a natural outcome of proper First Amendment analysis. And I'll get a little bit wonky, but try to be mainly um, uh, talk about what I think the First Amendment values and principles are um, to show why I and Justice Stevens and many, many, many people and many lawyers and judges think that Citizens United is actually contrary to First Amendment values of free speech. And, and it's an important thing to um, dig into a little bit as the debate about this is sometimes a debate about speech and I would not want anyone to think that um, those who favor the 28th Amendment are talking about amending the First Amendment. We're not. This is a very important national debate and conversation about the meaning of the First Amendment, not whether there's anything wrong with it. Um, so I, I'll say a little bit more about that. But number two, which I'll say a, a, a little bit about tonight, are that the consequences of Citizens United are, are, are so grave, um, so catastrophic, I think, for the country that it's also important to dig into that a little bit because this is not just a lawyers and judges debate, as you know. Um, this is, is, is really about the future of our country and I'll try to suggest why I think that is because where we are now is just the beginning. We are really at just the beginning of a experiment, um, an experiment that's very large, very fast moving, and I think very dangerous, and one that has never been tried in, in America or any other democratic society of unleashing concentrations of, of money and power in this way um, in elections and government. And then third, finally, which um, you may have um, predicted given my first two, uh, is that Citizens United won't last, um, that it will be overturned, and it will be overturned by us, Americans all over the country, in a cross-partisan way, um, through the process of amending the Constitution and winning the 28th Amendment. So let me dive in to number one, that, uh, a little bit about the First Amendment and why I think Citizens United is actually um, not only not an, a natural outcome of uh, applying the words of the First Amendment to uh, the facts in the case, but actually a very unnatural outcome um, that, that actually hurts First Amendment values. So um, let's go to the First Amendment and just start at the beginning. That's the entire amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohi prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Now, the freedom of speech phrase is obviously very important, but it's also critical to remember, as, as, as I think we do, that the First Amendment is not, even though it's isolated on this slide, it's actually not an isolated mechanical thing. It is part of a complex framework of the Constitution that seeks to ensure not only our liberty, but also our equality as human beings. This, this constitutional framework of which the First Amendment is a part is not only about individual autonomy, but also our own responsibilities to maintain checks and balances against concentrated power that has defeated humanity's efforts to have republics succeed since the beginning of time. Uh, this is, um, the, what we're facing now is exactly what the framers of the Constitution were concerned about because of historically, historically, republics tended to fail when power and money and wealth got concentrated and elevated in, from economic power into political power. Um, so it's important to put the First Amendment in the context of the rest of the Constitution. Now, that doesn't mean it's, uh, it's any easier. It still, of course, has uh, a lot of questions of interpretation and application. What does freedom of speech mean? It's a, it's a big phrase, but it's not defined there. Um, and, and for whom? Uh, does unlimited political spending advance the First Amendment and other constitutional liberties, or does it empower a privileged class, silence many others, and corrupt representative government? So even if one were to accept, which, which I don't, the idea, the metaphor, the trend of thinking of money as, as speech, uh, that doesn't begin to answer the question that 
Citizens United seemed to assume it answered. Once you equated money with speech, therefore restrictions on money in politics were censorship. Uh, but speech is not the same as freedom of speech. You know, if I come to our next town meeting uh, over at the high school here in Concord with a megaphone and talked for an hour despite the moderator's efforts and refused to stop talking, that's speech, but it's not freedom of speech, right? There's nothing wrong with taking the megaphone away and saying you've exceeded your time, not because it's censorship, but because it's necessary to protect the rights of other people and the ability of the democratic process to function. So I think other factors come into play as we think about the First Amendment and, and Citizens United. Uh, the effect of election laws on human beings. The Constitution opens, we the people. Uh, and it makes a difference whether the impacts of laws and striking down laws uh, affect human beings and fundamental rights of human beings, or our tools, whether those tools are corporate entities designed for purposes in the economic sphere or government entities, um, those are different than human beings. That should be a factor in the analysis. Our political equality should be a factor in the analysis. We may be unequal in all kinds of material ways in this country, but we never have classes of citizens. We reject the idea that there's different classes of power and citizenship based on one's wealth. Uh, and principles of one person, one vote, equal representation, the equal right of all of us to participate in self-government are key factors to consider in the First Amendment analysis. Now, you may think, as my kids used to say, duh, right? You know, <laughs> obviously. But the Supreme Court doesn't agree. Citizens United cast all of those factors aside. If I, as a lawyer, appeared in the Supreme Court and tried to argue that political equality is a reason to support, or at least not strike down, a limit on spending, I would be wasting, not only wasting my time, they would probably say, move on, we don't accept that idea of political equality being a reason. Literally, that's, that's how the law is now. What Justice Kennedy and the five justices and the majority in Citizens United said is there is only one factor that can stop a limit on spending or money in politics from being struck down by the First Amendment, or by their application of the First Amendment in this area. The only factor, the only thing that can warrant it is what Justice Kennedy described as quid pro quo corruption. That means um, essentially bribery. You know, you almost have to write a contract. I will stop a law or pass a law if you give me a bag of cash and there's pictures to prove it. I mean, quid pro quo corruption literally means that exchange. I will do this if you do that. Um, that we are still allowed to prohibit. By, by bribery, even though one could argue money is speech, I'm passing a bag of cash to express my strong support for oil subsidies. Um, that's my speech. If I say I'll give you a bag of cash if you continue oil subsidies, that's bribery. Fine line, I know, but that's the only line the Supreme Court will allow now. So all those other important factors that are really the bulwark of our of our American promise are taken off the map by Citizens United, not allowed to be considered. So the facts of Citizens United, I think, are also worth touching on again. Even though we've lived with them for six years, we sometimes forget how the case started rather differently. It started as a case involving a Virginia nonprofit corporation called Citizens United, thus the name. Uh, people ask me sometimes, Citizens United is a good thing. Why are you against Citizens United? We should be united. <laughs> and I have to explain. But the reason is the name, the name of the case comes from a nonprofit group called Citizens United um, in Virginia that wanted and did make a video attacking Hillary Clinton when she was considering running for president last time in 2008. Now, nothing wrong with that. She's a powerful politician, and um, part of democracy is we can attack powerful politicians and criti criticize them and urge people not to vote for them. The problem that led to the case was Citizens United um, wanted to use 
for-profit money, business from for business corporation money in part for this, and Citizens United, um, the video Judge Justice Kennedy concluded was actually a political, what he described as a feature length political attack ad, not really a movie. Now Citizens United didn't say that, they didn't actually want the case to go where it ended up going, that was at the court's initiative. But the reason the court was able to do that was they took the issues about nonprofit corporation, which were different at the time, and issues of media, which the McCain-Feingold, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, had an exception. So if it really was a movie or media um, that wasn't in the campaign context, it would have not even applied. But Justice Kennedy and the majority changed the case by essentially concluding, perhaps accurately, that it really was a political attack ad. They wanted to run it during the 30 to day 60 windows and they wanted to use corporate money to do it. That's putting it squarely within the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. Um, so once uh, the case had been cast that way as a, a really about whether business corporations or any corporation can spend unlimited money to influence the outcome of an election within a 30 to 60 day window, which is how Justice Kennedy ended up recasting the case, it didn't matter that it was a nonprofit or that it was a, a movie, that all changed, which is why we now have Exxon or Goldman Sachs or any corporation now spending money in elections. So the majority struck down the law, as I said, and um, opened the floodgates, as the phrase goes, to the unlimited money we now see. So, so what was the reasoning for this? Well, Justice Kennedy wrote the decision, the opinion for the five, and he explained that under the First Amendment, um, uh, laws that um, uh, discriminate against some speakers and, and not others are unconstitutional and that the 30 to 60 day limitation on corporate and union spending um, only applied to corporations and unions and since money is speech, it was what he called a ban on speech. And so Justice Kennedy uh, decided that um, corporations are quote, disfavored class of person um, and that depriving that disadvantaged person of the right to use speech to establish its worth, standing, and respect would violate the freedom of speech under the First Amendment. Um, this, needless to say, um, surprises folks that corporations are a disadvantaged class of person. And, um, and, and it is not, as I said, a natural reading of the First Amendment when you just look at the words. Um, one does not immediately begin to worry about whether uh, Chevron Corporation is not getting adequate respect um, and that the freedom of speech somehow has to be beefed up. It's, not, it's an unnatural and, and odd, to say the least, reading of the First Amendment. Um, the first to say that was Justice Stevens and four dissenters in the case. Uh, Justice Stevens was a Republican uh, corporate lawyer before his appointment to the court in the 70s. He wrote the dissent for um, the four justices and described the case, described the decision and the majority as a radical departure from First Amendment principles. Uh, from radical departure from what had been settled First Amendment law and as Justice Stevens pointed out, um, the framers of the Constitution and the First Amendment, the founders of the country, certainly were able to distinguish between corporations and human beings and intended freedom of speech to be that of human beings. Um, this started, as Justice Stevens said, with the founders of the country, but it continued all the way through our history. This is not a new problem. Um, what's new is that we have been incapacitated from dealing with it by Citizens United, but the problem of trying to separate economic power from political power so that everybody would have an equal voice is, is, is the age-old problem of America. And uh, as Justice Stevens described, the, the the challenge of keeping corporate money out of elections is one that the American people have picked up and worked on every generation. Um, he talked about the framers, but we can also look at the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act itself that limited corporate spending in elections, built on a 1907 law from the last Gilded Age that banned corporate contributions to political candidates. Uh, unions were added when unions began to get powerful and active and and using economic concentrations of money in politics, unions were added in the Taft-Hartley Act 1948 to that prohibition. 
And it wasn't just on the books, it was enforced. We forget sometimes that the Watergate scandal that drove President Nixon to resign uh, from the White House was in many ways a corporate spending, <laughs> corporate political spending scandal. And more than a dozen very large corporations were prosecuted and convicted of crimes for political spending involving the Nixon White House and the 1972 election. Prosecuted and convicted. No one, by the way, and this is hardly, you know, in the age old 200 years ago. <laughs> this, this is in our lifetimes for many of us. Nobody thought those corporations had First Amendment rights to spend that money. The corporations didn't raise First Amendment defenses saying that you can't prosecute us. We're, it's a First Amendment right to spend that money. It wasn't. This is new. This is very new. Um, and so I think if we uh, move forward from the 70s to see how it happened, I talked about those two trends. And they did go back to the late 70s. Um, you know, the, the, the idea that corporations were like people first came up in the Bellotti versus First National Bank of Boston case right here, Attorney General Frank Bellotti trying to defend our law, our state law that tried to keep corporate money out of citizen ballot initiatives. That was the first case in history of America that struck down a state campaign finance law trying to keep corporate money out of, out of, out of uh, ballot initiatives or elections. Um, it was struck down in five to four decision written by Justice Powell. Um, there's a book about Justice Powell and, that I've written, so I'll tell you corporations are not people. You can get the whole story there, but the, the, um, that, that was in 1978. Buckley was in 1976, but even after that, this was, that was considered controversial, highly novel, and hotly contested after on the court and elsewhere. Um, in 1990, Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce was a case it upheld Michigan's law, state laws. It said they're perfectly fine to keep corporate money out of election campaigns. Um, and that decision was written by Thurgood Marshall, but most of the language and analysis came out of dissents in previous corporate speech cases that Justice William Rehnquist, a conservative, did. Just, Justice Rehnquist dissented again and again and again in this idea that corporations have speech rights. And as Thurgood Marshall shows, it was across the political spectrum, raising the alarm about unlimited corporate money in elections. And you know, Justice Rehnquist had some interesting words I'll just share with you uh, briefly. Restrictions, he said, upon the political activity of business corporations are both politically desirable and constitutionally permissible. The state grants to a business corporation the blessings of a perpetual life and limited liability to enhance its efficiency as an economic entity. These properties beneficial in the economic sphere are very hazardous in the political sphere. That was Justice Rehnquist dissenting as this trend gathered force. So the 2003 case of McConnell versus FEC actually affirmed and upheld the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, the very act that was struck down only you know, four years, five years later in Citizens United, had been previously decided it was perfectly constitutional. And what happened? Did the First Amendment change between 2003 and 2010? No, the court changed. Chief Justice Rehnquist died. Sandra Day O'Connor, who was supportive of, of campaign finance limits on spending, retired from the court, and Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Samuel Alito replaced them. And we got a new five to four lineup, and we got Citizens United. So that's point number one. The First Amendment does not require the situation we now face. Uh, you know, the First Amendment is not at war with our aspirations for fair elections, free elections, and, and the participation of all of us in a government that isn't corrupted. Um, so, let me get to the second proposition, uh, the consequences of, of this. And the consequences of, of Citizens United are, uh, as Ch uh, Justice Breyer, still on the court, says, um, pose the grave question of democratic legitimacy. Jim Leach, Iowa Republican for congressman for years from Iowa, uh, Republican, then chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, calls, says the Citizens United has, 
quote, genetically altered our national DNA for democracy, pushing the country towards corporatist oligarchy. This is Jim Leach, you know, he, he wasn't an Occupy protester, he's a Republican from Iowa for, for 30 years in Congress. So why are we getting these kind of alarms? Well, since Citizens United, more than $30 billion has flowed into the elections since from corporations, billionaires, and some unions. And these numbers are rapidly escalating. Uh, they're not moderating, they're escalating. And more worrisome, they're concentrating into fewer sources. And the link between those who spend and those who get policy or block policy is increasingly obvious to everyone. Most Americans now, in the way we now have defined our elections and democracy as a marketplace where money purchases more, uh, most Americans do not and cannot participate, if that's how we think of participation. Money from far less than 1% makes up most of the political contributions and spending in America. 400 families, only 400 families account for more than half of the money in the presidential race so far. Uh, you know, in a, in a nation of 330 million, to say 400 families come up with half of the money in, in elections, you'd think you're talking about, um, well, an oligarchy somewhere. Um, that, and, but we're talking about the United States of America. 400 families. In the 2012 election, 32 super PAC donors made up more money through the super PACs than all of the small donors, millions of small donors, to both Barack Obama and Mitt Romney's campaign combined. For 32 donors wiped out the millions of small donors of people trying to participate in that money way. So that's concentrated money. It's not just the amount, it's the concentration. And it's intended to buy power, it's intended to control the direction of the country for private, not public gain. Last week, Hank Greenberg, um, if you remember Hank Greenberg, he was CEO of AIG and the largest shareholder of AIG for many, many, many years. He was CEO. Um, the only reason he's no longer CEO is because AIG received uh, $85 billion of your money in the bailouts in 2008. And um, in a, in a um, rare instance of CEO accountability, uh, the government asked him to step aside. Uh, and uh, most of that money, by the way, went to Goldman Sachs, which was on the other side of the AIG derivative contracts. Um, so it was both a bailout of AIG and Goldman Sachs, a twofer for you. And um, after the bailout, you'd think Hank would have if not been embarrassed, at least been happy that his company had been bailed out, he wasn't. He sued the US government, saying that it should have been more money for the AIG shareholders. Um, that suit is still pending. It's a $40 billion lawsuit. And the reason I say that is because last week, Hank uh, Greenberg gave $10 million to a presidential campaign super PAC. So this is a guy who not only you know might be interested in the um, you know, election. This is a guy who has $40 billion riding on who wins the, the presidential race and who appoints the next attorney general who might settle the $40 billion litigation that he has pending against the government. Now, sometimes billionaires uh, draw the most attention. We can all run through the names you hear in the news of, of billionaires and their favorite presidential candidates. Um, but what we don't see enough of, um, and it's not because it's not there, it's because it's hidden, is the corporate money that's pouring in to our elections through so-called dark money channels. These nonprofit corporations um, that are not required to disclose donors, uh, but, but funnel money into elections. I'm just gonna give three examples of these. There's many of them. And uh, one is the US Chamber of Commerce. The other is the Democratic Governors Association. And the third is the Republican Governors Association. We're, we're cross-partisan. Here. So let's look at the, those three alone have spent $700 million in elections after Citizens United and up to 2014. We don't have any 2016 numbers because the zero there uh, is the amount they voluntarily disclose. Uh, they don't disclose any of it. They don't disclose their sources. 
Um, we know some of their sources, though, because long after the election, you can piece together the information from IRS tax filings, like 990s, or SEC reports from, um, or shareholder reports from the corporation spending the money. And so we can look at where this $700 million that funneled through these three uh, so-called nonprofits uh, went to, and, and went right into elections, state elections and federal elections. And uh, if we go to the next slide, um, we will see a lot of familiar logos. Um, these are the top donors to these three entities, a, a mix of different donors. There's lots more, but um, they're corporations. And then there's a handful of unions uh, that come up on the Democratic Governors Association ledger, as do corporations. Um, but, but you'll see all of those um, from uh, you know, Walmart, PepsiCo, Pfizer, to the Teamsters, SEIU, and others. Uh, so that's $700 million, just three of these entities, in just a, couple, a handful of elections since Citizens United, and it's getting worse. Um, so that's, you know, these corporate logos up here have very little to do with the free speech of Americans. Um, and it's not speech, it's, it's really more like power. It's more like investing than speech. And it's investments that are a lot of money because they have a lot of return. The finance industry has spent $8.6 billion on campaign spending and lobbying in recent years, and the finance industry has received $780 billion in taxpayer subsidies. The oil, coal, and gas industry spent $543 million to defeat the American Clean Energy and Security Act and to keep fossil fuel subsidies coming. They spent $200 million additional dollars in political campaigns after Citizens United and the annual taxpayer subsidy to the oil and gas industry is about $7 billion. I could go on, but you probably could too. And I think most Americans know now uh, that people without extravagant resources or without a corporate treasury to draw on uh, are not able to participate and get equal representation in this kind of game. And as a result, we are seeing what sadly might be a rational decision, but a catastrophic one for our democracy, a complete collapse in, in the basic citizenship duty of voting. Um, maybe perhaps the least uh, you know, of the duties of citizenship to come in on election day and cast your ballot, uh, not many people are coming in anymore. Uh, the midterm election in 2014 had national turnout of about 33%. Means two out of three Americans didn't even vote. Uh, the Boston City Council race last, just this past November, if you remember, there were some hotly contested city council races, just over 13% turnout. You know, 87% uh, decided to stay home. Um, in states, including Maine, where there was a clean elections ballot initiative, it was about 23%. So the vast, vast majority of Americans are saying either, I don't care or I'm resigned to this is hopeless, or I don't want to be a sucker and pa cast my ballot in a system I don't believe in. Whatever the reason, and maybe there's many others, we're seeing a collapse in voting and turnout. Um, so, and, and this may be related, there's other factors too, I'm sure. Uh, Congress's approval ratings are below 15%. The re-election rating is over 95%. So, uh, now remember, there's another part of Citizens United. This is a lot about the money, and some of it's corporate money, but the other trend that they, the Citizens United decision locked down was this idea that corporations are like people and have rights. And corporate lawyers have not, uh, did not, um, that, that part of the case did not escape their notice. Uh, and as a result, we are seeing waves of new litigation around the country where corporations are attacking public interest laws with claims of constitutional rights. We've had, since Citizens United, healthcare, state healthcare privacy laws struck down, food labeling laws struck down, cigarette warnings struck down, SEC financial regulations struck down, local ballot initiatives where people in St. Louis wanted a chance to vote on whether their tax subsidy, their tax dollars should be going to multinational corporations, including Peabody Coal, Peabody Energy, which is headquartered in St. Louis. They wanted to vote on whether that should continue. They were sued. 
not allowed to vote. Corporations claimed that that would violate the equal protection rights. They remember Justice Kennedy's right to equal dignity and respect. So you can't vote on whether fossil fuel corporations are going to continue to get taxpayer subsidies. That vote was blocked. And corporations are even now bringing lawsuits against communities that pass minimum wage laws. Seattle and LA did it by ballot initiative, raised the minimum wage, faced prompt litigation by corporations claiming that too violates free speech rights and equal protection rights of corporations. So this is the consequence in only a few short years after Citizens United, and it's going to get worse. And I want to just leave the consequences with one thing I try to remember, which is these are a lot of facts and numbers and principles about the Constitution and so forth. But behind all of it, every single day in America are human beings where the consequences are very grave. And, and I was reminded of this in writing the book when I went down to West Virginia and met um, a woman who's now a friend, Betty Hara, uh, and her brother, Stevie, was killed in the Upper Big Branch mine explosion uh, in West Virginia. And uh, he'd been an army veteran, left behind an eight-year-old son. Massey Corporation operated that mine and in the years before the explosion, uh, which happened you know, a few months, coincidentally, after Citizens United, in the years before the explosion, the corporation had had 63,000 violations of the Mine Safety Act and 13,000 violations of the Clean Water Act, and nothing had been done. Uh, Betty told me about her brother uh, and the other miners talking with each other and with her about being afraid to go into work, not knowing whether they would come home, uh, but being af also afraid to say anything uh, or to report it or to complain about the conditions. And then the explosion happened. Steve and 29 men died. Now, after the explosion, the governor of West Virginia appointed a commission to study this. What happened? You know, and often these studies are, you know, mine technical reasons why um, these tragedies happen, coal dust or what have you. And of course, some of those factors were there. But what was amazing is that this commission, an independent commission, concluded that it wasn't an accident. The United Mine Workers called it industrial homicide. And according to the commission's report, the explosion was, uh, and the deaths were a direct result of Massey Energy Corporation's political spending and resulting immunity from government oversight. The commission found, and I'm quoting, that Massey had used vast amounts of money to influence the political system and created a complete intertwining of coal and government, and that the men paid for that with their lives. That was the commission's report, independent commission appointed by the governor. After the explosion and these deaths and these findings, Massey um, sort of, in its view, the corporate view, solved the problem by merging with an even bigger global coal company called Alpha. And in that merger, Don Blankenship, the CEO who ran the crime wave that the corporation had done and was responsible for what happened, uh, Don Blankenship resigned and received $86 million um, in, in that merger. So this is what the Citizens United world looks like. Uh, radically unequal rights. I wanted to show that slide for a second. That's Betty and uh, Steve's son, Zach, in the top left. The middle is some folks I met on Blair Mountain. <coughs> Mountains all over Appalachia are getting uh, destroyed by mount coal, uh, mountaintop removal, coal mining. Um, and then that's Don Blankenship down in the corner. And these are all Americans who literally grew up in the same corner of West Virginia together. And you can see you know, the, the kind of world we're moving towards, they don't end up in the same place. And I, I think it is relevant in our First Amendment analysis in looking at the role of money in politics and, and whether we're adequately overseeing corporations and can under our Constitution, that we look at the human beings and the impacts we have and whether we are delivering on our promise of equal, equal rights, equal citizenship, and, and human liberty. So, these are grave consequences. I think Justice Breyer's right. I think that, uh, uh, um, th that Jim Leach is right when they talk about Citizens United as moving us towards corporate oligarchy. And so uh, I will move to your relief and mine, my third proposition, 
that um, we will bring an end to this, that we will win the 28th Amendment, we will overturn Citizens United, and I think it will happen uh, within the next few years. Um, so the reason I think is clear, um, but I'll, I'll outline them very quickly and then just share what, my, what I've seen around the country and where I think we are on this, but the reason is this is a constitutional crisis now. It's not a campaign finance wonky, you know, what the law should be. It's not um, about, you know, regulatory steps. We face a constitutional crossroads. One road is the Citizens United road to oligarchy. The other road is the 28th Amendment back to democracy. Um, that's it. The, the Citizens United values, what Citizens United proposes about citizens and human beings, about corporations and money, and about the functioning, the actual, what is a democracy? Is it a marketplace or is it a special place where equal people get to participate? Those, those values that Citizens United reflects are at war with the American promise of equal citizenship, human liberty, and responsible self-government. It's not the First Amendment that's at war with those, it's the Citizens United decision that's at war with those. So one of them has to change, you can't have both. So we have the American promise or we have Citizens United. And so when the stakes are like that, I think Americans respond as they have been. Uh, and um, the only way to change a Supreme Court decision like this is a constitutional amendment or the Supreme Court can overturn its own decisions. I want to take a minute to walk through why this Supreme Court will not do that, why we need a constitutional amendment. The Supreme Court has had a chance. 2012, a case came up out of Montana. We, the Free Speech for People participated in it, brought a, a brief to the case. Montana law had banned corporate spending in elections since 1912, and many other states did similarly. And the Montana case came up to the Supreme Court, struck down. Montana law that had stood for more than 100 years, struck down under Citizens United. Massachusetts, we had a law like that, wiped off the books. Many other states wiped off the books. They did not reconsider Citizens United as Ruth Bader Ginsburg and several dissenters said they should have, they doubled down on it and wiped out state laws as well as federal laws that had intended to protect the integrity of our democracy. Months later, after states like Arizona and Maine where they have public funding of elections and tried to have a, what they call a clean election system, th those states had passed mechanisms trying to deal with this onslaught of outside money on a fragile public funding system that depended on many, many small donors and then a match from the public, um, public funding if you prove that you had support from a wide number of people who would give as low as $5. Um, then you could run and you could have enough to run without catering or being dependent on very large funders. Well, the case came to the Supreme Court out of Arizona because the wealthy donors said that the new mechanism to match their overwhelming outside spending violated their free speech rights to spend unlimited money without triggering a public response. The court agreed, five to four, once again, empowering the very wealthy um, and disempowering us in our ability to try to work through these problems at the state level. Next case came up, you might have heard McCutcheon versus the Federal Election Commission. What did McCutcheon involve? It involved a aggregate limit on contributions to federal candidates, that means aggregate across the country, you want to give to every single person running for Congress or Senate and max out as they say at the fundraisers to every candidate, um, you had to stop under the old rule at $123,000 a year because they, the idea was you don't want one person kind of pulling all the strings, you know, getting too much influence with the, especially with the parties because you know, you, you, you know how these things work. The, the Speaker of the House or the Senate Majority Leader does a fundraiser and says, yeah, we want you to max out to everybody and to the state committees and suddenly you've gone to a fundraiser for $2,700 and you're getting hit up for $3.2 million. Uh, because, and that is both a, a problem both from the political shakedown side and from the undue influence side. So the limit had been at $123,000. I know many of you probably were frustrated that your free speech rights weren't liberated and you had to stop at $123,000 a year in your gifts to politicians, um, but you are now free at last uh, and you can go into the millions for those kind of contributions. 
Now, uh, it, it's funny, except it's not. You know, it really is striking that this Supreme Court thinks that $123,000 a year is a, to stop and restrict it there is a unconstitutional violation of the freedom of speech. $123,000 is more than almost all Americans make in a year, well over 90% make for everything, their full wages, let alone what they're going to give to politicians. $123,000 is three times more than a hundred million dollars, a hundred million Americans make in a year, three times more. And that was viewed as a violation of freedom of speech if we try to level the playing field. And don't say level the playing field in Chief Justice Roberts's courtroom, or literally he'll jump on you. That is not a reason. We are not allowed to level the playing field under the new First Amendment. So um, if we could move to the um, Let's go ahead one more uh, on the slides. This is uh, a, the winning argument in the McCutcheon case. Contribution limits may not be upheld as a means of limiting disparities in the extent to which people of different economic backgrounds are able to participate in the political process and exercise their First Amendment rights. I mean, think about that. This is the winning argument. And under this argument, our Constitution now requires that people of different economic backgrounds have different classes of citizenship. That's to say, if your economic status means you're limited in your ability to participate, you're limited in your representation, or your ability to get involved, or in your ability to access public officials um, be because you don't have the money to play in this game, not only is that just fine with this court, it's constitutionally required. Uh, and that, that's the winning argument in the McCutcheon case. So what do we do? This court, clearly, we can bring any case that's going to go to this court is going to make things worse, not better. Um, so we don't have an avenue to overturn the Supreme Court except for a constitutional amendment. And so uh, that's what we're going to do. And uh, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying reform short of that aren't a good idea. Um, you know, disclosure, regulatory steps of various kinds, some publicly financed elections, all good things, um, they're good things. But we have to, in my view, um, recognize that solutions on a scale that will be effective that are short of constitutional resetting of our constitutional foundation, not only won't work, they may well take longer than the constitutional amendment to accomplish, but we can't build good reform on a foundation of unequal citizenship, um, on corporate rights, not human rights, and on a, a nation of angry or uh, resigned consumers or spectators, not citizens. You, you, we, won't, we can't just do democratic reform, small d, democratic or small r, republican reform, without fixing our constitution. So that's why we need the amendment. Um, now, the Supreme Court could change, and I just want to say, Let's focus on the amendment let, and you know, we get a new justice, that would be wonderful, I'd like it. You know, a new five to four decision would be fine, but we can't look at that as a solution instead of the amendment. And I wanna offer a couple of reasons why. Number one, it probably will split the great 80% consensus that supports a constitutional amendment. Uh, because to, get a, a, to raise the stakes even higher on the partisanship because we desperately need a fifth vote and we want the right president to appoint that fifth justice is a partisan strategy. It depends on a one, one party winning that we think will put the right justice in place. That will not only break the 80 plus cons percent consensus to support a constitutional amendment and overturn Citizens United, it reinforces the broken system we have because it will depend on large donors, large fundraising, and all of the things we are trying to change. And finally, it fails to build what the huge opportunity we have right now. And that's the kind of wave of re-engaged citizens, a new covenant of citizenship, where Americans come together to do as we have before, seven times before, to reaffirm our American promise that we actually believe in, that we believe we're equal citizens. We believe political equality is part of the First Amendment analysis. You know, we believe in our own responsibility as citizens. That's what an amendment can build. And I wanna, let's look at the polls. Since Citizens United, every single poll 
has Americans together on this. These are several polls every year since Citizens United have somewhere between 67 and 80 plus percent support for limiting money in elections for overturning Citizens United with the 28th Amendment. The most recent was Bloomberg just a month or two ago, which had Republican support for overturning Citizens United at 80 percent. Democrats are over that, independents are around the same. So this is something we are already winning. We just have to bring us together and double down on our efforts as citizens to, to move forward from here. We've got the consensus. We've got the um, action. People aren't just answering polls. They're taking action across the country. Many of you here, I know, have acted like this. And we have 700 cities and towns now. Conservative, I was talking to a fellow back there from Bedford, New Hampshire, conservative. Uh, town, and he said at his town meeting, they passed one of these resolutions demanding the 28th Amendment. And 700 across the country so far, we're going to see a lot more. Um, 16 states have enacted, including Massachusetts, enacted 28th Amendment resolutions. Two by ballot initiative, one in Montana, one in Colorado, uh, both passed 75% to 25%. Mitt Romney won Montana that day by 10 points. The same voters voted for the 28th Amendment to overturn Citizens United by 75 to 25 percent. And, and, and this works, uh, this kind of effort works to win votes in Congress. Um, we now have 150 House members uh, on board the amendment work. We have 54 senators who voted for the Democracy for All Amendment. And what that Democracy for All Amendment does, it received 54 votes in the Senate in September 2014. We need, by the way, 67 or 68 votes in the Senate, ratification by 38 states to win. Um, but this vote in the Senate uh, was for the Democracy for All Amendment, which overturned Citizens United and Buckley in cases that say we have no right to limit money in elections. It gives us back the right through our state governments, local, federal, to limit money in order specifically to advance democratic self-government and political equality for all to protect the integrity of government and the electoral process. That's putting back into the First Amendment what it has always had, uh, the values of political equality, the values of anti-corruption, the things Citizens United stripped out of it. Again, this is not about fixing anything wrong with the First Amendment. It's about fixing what's wrong with the Supreme Court and restoring the First Amendment. So now, where do we go from here? Uh, we're launching American Promise. Um, all over the country, every community in the country will be able to form, join together with their neighbors, citizens, and meetings just like this, form local associations, uh, American Promise Associations. They can call them whatever they want, but they'll get lots of support, lots of networked um, energy and support, um, and lots of um, aggregating and scaling up this 80%, these millions and millions of Americans that are already together but don't know it yet or aren't connected yet to be connected, to go move together, to actually win the amendment, to get these states ready for ratification, which will force the amendment to the two-thirds of Congress that we need. And then they're not going to go home. This, this new realignment of our American politics around a new covenant of responsible citizenship and the American promise, they're going to stick together and drive the kind of waves of reform we have always seen in America when the chips are down. You know, Winston Churchill said that uh, Americans always do the right thing after exhausting the other possibilities. <laughs> so we have been in holes before and we always dig ourselves out, but we never do it until we go through a lot of effort together and we come together and we do what's really, really hard. And so now we're in that situation just like our uh, previous generations of Americans. And, and, and I, for one, am delighted because it's a historic chance um, to do something that will make a huge difference, not just for us, but for future generations and, um, and recommit us all to this great uh, American promise. So we'll overturn Citizens United. I hope you'll join us. There's information on the back. I hope you'll join the league and engage in the study. And I'd welcome more conversation now about all of this. Thank you very much.
questions? Does anybody know the location?